Uh, so welcome, everybody. I know it's a holiday and uh, this isn't your ideal thing to do on President's Day, or maybe it is. Uh, this is actually, I'm, I'm not too bad. I skied this morning, so that was my holiday break. And now we're going to talk a little business here with uh, Dylan. Um, I'm going to let him do his introduction and tell you where he's at and what he's been doing and how he got there and all of that. But uh, um, really appreciate him. He's uh, currently in Kansas City, the Andersons, and uh, I'll let you take it over, Dylan. Awesome. Well, yeah, I'll go ahead and get this sharing going. Let's make sure this works. Is that coming through? Yep, I can see it on my end. Looks good. Perfect. Hang on. There we go. All righty. So, yeah, a little bit of background here on myself first. So, um, yeah, Dylan Guzzle, uh, born and raised in uh, Idaho. Uh, born on the east side of the state, but then spent most of my life in Boise. Um, came to Utah State, studied finance, and graduated in uh, 2018. Um, really big into skiing and hiking, anything outdoors, camping. Um, you know, I go to the gym fairly often. A uh, bit of a foodie, I would say. I like to eat around uh, Kansas City. There's a lot of great food out here being, you know, in the Midwest. Some decent, uh, some decent barbecue in Kansas City. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. I've had, <laughs> we had some friends in town or one of my coworkers had friends in town. I ate barbecue probably three and a half, four times here in the last week. So um, it's, uh, yeah, anytime a customer's in town, you got to go get KC barbecue. Very sweet barbecue. Mm. Um, but uh, yeah, big into sports, uh, fantasy football, big Denver Broncos fan. Um, I like sports betting, um, you know, just anything uh, that kind of combines the interest of uh, money, trading and, and sports is a, a nice, nice fix for me to kind of get uh, both sides of that going. But um, yeah, so started my career with Lansing Trade Group uh, right after graduation in 2018. Uh, Lansing was acquired by the Andersons in 2019. Um, kind of bounced around a few different teams uh, during my time here with the company. So I uh, started with the Northeast Grains team which is a corn, wheat, and soybean trading team based out of uh, the Northeast. So I was actually in upstate New York uh, for that first uh, six-month rotation there. Then moved back to uh, our Kansas City office where I was uh, the first half of 2019, uh, traded cottonseed. Uh, it's primarily used in the dairy feed world. Um, it's a byproduct of the cotton ginning process. Um, high fat, high protein, high fiber, all in one product there. So um, really focused on the dairy market there. Then I moved to our Omaha, Nebraska team where I was a junior trader for six months on our Western corn desk. So I was trading primarily uh, rail based transportation, uh, single rail cars of corn um, going anywhere from Iowa, Illinois, uh, Nebraska, all the way up to California, uh, the whole Pacific Northwest, um, just anywhere west of the Mississippi, really. Uh, then I moved back to Auburn, New York, spent another two and a half or so years actually in New York. Um, before we uh, shut down the office there about a year ago, I moved back to Kansas City, still on the Northeast Grains team here today, but uh, that is winding down as I'm getting ready to uh, make a pivot over and join our energy desk here. I'll be starting to trade propane uh, in April. So um, yeah, a lot of different experience, uh, but it all- Yeah, I mean, I didn't realize how many times you've kind of switched and moved around a little bit. That's a, that's a yeah. busy couple of years. It is. And part of that is, you know, they they've got this philosophy, which I agree 100 percent here, that the more trading experience you can get in different markets and different transportation modes, um, just different asset classes in general, the more profitable you're going to be as a trader down the road. And, um, you know, kind of hence this this upcoming move here to propane. Hmm. And let me ask you one question in terms of the um, acquisition. How, how was that? I mean, um, I mean, was it you know, a, a big firm kind of swallowing up a smaller firm. I mean, did you feel yeah. any kind of acquisition pains from that or how did it go on your end? Yeah. So I'll kind of paint the picture first and then I'll dive into kind of the actual details of how it went here. So um, the Andersons had already been fairly well invested in, in Lansing Trade Group, the uh, original company I worked for. At one point, they held a majority stake. They uh, sold some equity back sometime in the mid 2010s. Um, and dropped back into minority shareholder status, uh, but still had, I want to say, around 32 and a half percent or something like that. So Anderson's was very familiar with us. We were very familiar with Anderson's. Um, Anderson's was more of an asset based uh, ag business. So, you know, very much into grain storage, large facilities, very uh, efficient uh, in terms of asset operations. Lansing was a little bit more kind of point to point aggressive uh, trade. Uh, what we call cross-country trade in the business. And so um, it was really a, 
you know, transactionally, it was an acquisition, but really in terms of kind of business structure, it was much more of a merger. You had a lot of uh, kind of Lansing traders who had, you know, spent their whole career just doing point to point, being aggressive, finding any bit of margin anywhere out there, now getting assigned to work on asset based trading. You had asset traders that were being forced to go get that cross country experience. And so, you know, acquisition, but very merger esque in terms of kind of how it all all flowed. Um, and it's funny looking back at it, you know, two or three years ago, um, Lansing has basically taken over the trade division of the Andersons. And so, you know, a lot of the original Lansing um, executives leadership are now Anderson's leadership. And so, you know, the whole thing is kind of an interesting uh, deal, in my opinion, because, you know, transactionally, it was an acquisition. In reality, it was, you know, I guess kind of a merger is how it felt. But overall, I mean, us, the purchased company, we kind of took things over. So very interesting. But, yeah, that is that is interesting. So, well, what is physical commodity trading? Um, you know, I, I think most people, uh, most students right now that are kind of wondering, you know, hey, trading, what is this? They're probably in a very similar situation to what I was, you know, not very familiar with the physical side of it. Obviously, knowing that there's futures contracts, there's stuff traded on screens, you know, that's kind of, you know, all my focus was, but at the end of the day, commodities are, are a physically used product here that have to be shipped around to different end use points. You know, whether we're talking about oil, gas, metals, grains, coffee, sugar, uh, these are all examples of bulk commodities that are, you know, actual products being produced at one location, being consumed at another location, a lot of times with value added streams in the middle. So most large trading firms are typically invested in the actual supply chain, you know, whether that is production, whether that's logistics, whether that's, you know, storage operations, uh, value add processing. Most uh, firms that have real physical commodity traders are invested somewhere along the supply chain. It doesn't really make sense to be, you know, purely third party trader. Um, it's a it's a very tight uh, very low margin business. And so, you know, having that asset base or, or having some sort of just involvement in the process there uh, tends to give you a leg up. Um, so big firms in general, you know, a lot of these are going to be more oil, gas, or metals here. Uh, VTOL, uh, Glencore, Cargill, I'm sure most of you are familiar with Coke Industries, uh, ADM, Traffic Era. These are, you know, some of the big commodity players. And so um, a few of these guys are, are uh, in grains. Uh, Glencore has their uh, grain division called Viterra. Uh, recently purchased uh, another division that was called Gavilon before, um, and they're adding that to their Viterra uh, footprint here. Going to be one of the, they're probably like the fifth largest grain handler in the United States. Um, Cargill, single largest private company in America, if not the world. Uh, I can't remember last time I looked at that, but anyways, very much grains focused. Uh, ADM, uh, largest flour milling company in the world. Uh, again, very grains focused. So um, Coke Industries, you know, they tend to be a little bit more fertilizer chemical based these days. They had an ethanol division that processed corn, uh, but all these guys are very ag adjacent at the very least. So that being said, Anderson specifically, um, you know, we're a large supply chain company, agricultural supply chain company based out of Miami, Ohio. Uh, we own assets in grain storage and exports. Uh, we have fertilizer production, ethanol production, um, some human food production. Um, and then we just spun off recently our rail division and our, oh, what was the other one here? Oh no, just the rail division. Uh, we had uh, both rail leasing and then rail repair uh, facilities around the country, uh, but we divested from that to focus a little bit more on the core business of um, grains and fertilizers here. So our trade division is uh, the division that I'm in. We're headquartered in Overland Park, Kansas, Kansas City suburb. Um, so we trade primarily grains, feed ingredients, biofuels, oil and gas, carbon, uh, carbon credits, that is, um, and then transportation. So um, the actual, you know, right to transport, you can trade on paper contracts. You can, you also need it to actually ship your goods. Um, so there's trading in the transportation end as well. So just explain for a second, when you say a paper, tra uh, paper uh, transaction, yep. just so they have some, have some idea what you're talking about. Yeah, Absolutely. So transportation, um, you know, it's very contract based. And so a lot of times, you know, you will want to buy the right to have transportation, whether that's buying the right to uh, private use of cars, rail cars, for example, that will trade in its own secondary market away from the actual product that would be put into the cars on what's called the COTS market, uh, which is, I believe, Certificate of Transportation Services. 
Um, and so you can trade paper with that where, you know, you'll buy thinking that, you know, your cost of freight or your cost of, of being able to use the freight is undervalued in the market. You can then sell that out later. You've only ever exchanged an actual contract. That's called a paper trade. Yep. Now, if you're actually, you know, buying that contract to use it to ship corn, that would be a freight trade. So, uh, it, you know, it, it allows you calling things paper trades is just looking at, you know, the actual underlying, but not ever touching or handling. Perfect. So big thing about physical traders, uh, you know, how do we make money? Uh, you know, we're, we're taking tiny margins here on uh, most of our transactions here. Um, I think I ran the numbers on, on most of my corn that, you know, right now corn's trading for $8, $9 a bushel in the Northeast where I trade. We're making 10, 15 cents a bushel. So, you know, you're one to one and a half percent of your actual total product value, uh, which is not a very sustainable model if you're just taking, you know, half a percent, one percent off of every uh, every transaction. So we focus on different types of market arbitrage um, to expand the margins after our initial trade. So within physical trading, we kind of have three main types of arbitrage that we look at being time arbitrage, quality arbitrage and physical arbitrage. Um, the first two here are a big part of what I do. Um, I'll kind of briefly explain them, but then I'm gonna go a lot further deep uh, into the physical trade uh, or physical arbitrage as that's you know, kind of our bread and butter here at the Andersons. That's what I built my career on understanding. Um, so um, real quickly here though, time arbitrage is just the idea of being able to purchase a product, store it and deliver it into the market later for a profit. So um, you're talking market structures where you're covering the cost of your inventory, uh, both purchasing, uh, the interest on, you know, not receiving money for your product, um, any actual storage costs that you may be accruing in terms of paying a facility, maybe you've got your own facility that you've got your fixed costs on. But in general, there are opportunities where the market will, will say, <clears throat> hey, we need corn three months, six months down the road. And so right now our futures prices are going to be, you know, according to that. So um, I don't think there's a really good example in the grain marketplace right now. But uh, two or three years ago, wheat uh, was a commodity that had very large carries where you have uh, further dated futures contracts trading at premiums to your near term. So with futures, uh, you know, the big thing is timing. So, you know, most commodities will trade either 12 months of futures with a settlement each month. Grains, we trade uh, usually five or six contracts per year. Um, but again, it's, it's kind of focused seasonally with, you know, settlement timeframes. But when the market is out there saying that, hey, we need this product more further down the road, we're going to structure in a carry here that allows elevators, grain elevators, um, to purchase product, sit on it and do nothing and make money later on. Now, you have to actually trade the future spreads, which you know might mean buying the front month, selling the deferred month in order to kind of capture that spread. But there's a way to, to capture that time value that uh, when it's out there. Um, but yeah, just... I kind of explained it at a high level, just figure it as when the market says you can make money storing it, that's time arbitrage. Quality arbitrage is uh, mainly focused on blending, cleaning. Um, it's, it's a little bit of a value add. Um, wheat is the grain uh, that we focus on that is that has the most uh, quality arbitrage. So um, hard wheat, which is uh, the wheat grown in most Western parts of the country, uh, trades on a protein spec. And so depending on your growing conditions, uh, you'll have different levels of protein in a crop in a region. Uh, in general, lower moisture means higher protein, higher moisture uh, during the growing season means less protein. Now, flour mills around the country need to have a specific level of protein that they are using as their standard for when they're milling wheat to be used it for flour for specific purposes, whether that's pasta, whether that's uh, bread, whether that's cakes, well, that's crackers, there's different protein levels that all these various levels of wheat need to have. And so an example of quality arbitrage here is say you've got some you know, high protein wheat coming in from a couple farmers in one area, you've got some low protein wheat coming in from farmers in a different area, you can discount that lower protein wheat, blend it with your higher protein wheat, end up with a consistently, uh, a consistent product that is basically a capture of the cheap price and the standard price and you're now making more of that high price product so um yeah just just uh you know cleaning is an, another example here 
Uh, you know, say, uh, say you're able to buy some product that's, you know, in relatively bad condition, you can have your grain cleaned. Um, now it becomes higher priced. So it's just a form of value add in the marketplace. Physical arbitrage, this is my favorite, like I said, um, involves efficient transportation um, and often results in product moving in different routes than you had planned, you know, during the initial transaction. Um, so I'm going to jump into a, a little bit more here and then go into an example. Hey, hey, let me ask you, let me ask you a question, kind of a, a, yeah. a background question. Absolutely. Did you have, I mean, uh, lived in Idaho, raised in Idaho. I mean, did you have a kind of an ag background? Did you, were you familiar kind of the farming and, and some of this other stuff? Or was this, was this kind of all new to you? And, and you were just like the finance, the trading aspect of it. And it just happens to be that, that the, you know, the asset you're trading is ag based. Exactly. Kind of what you said, the second part there. So I did not have any ag uh, background. I grew up in the suburbs in Boise, um, you know, zero ag experience. I didn't know what a bushel was uh, before I came and worked here. Um, you know, I didn't understand how, you know, uh, futures contract settlement worked within the grain world or anything like that. So to me, I saw an opportunity to get into trading. Uh, I knew that I knew enough about numbers and was a curious, curious enough person uh, to be able to figure out any industry that I went and worked in. Perfect. Good question, though. Part of why I'm excited to get into energy here, a little bit more just numbers, less, uh, <laughs> less other stuff. But anyways, <laughs> Um, yeah, so kind of what, like I was saying there, you know, I have experience in these time-based trades, quality-based trades, but physical arbitrage is what kind of, um, captured my attention, uh, when I was learning about the industry. Um, it's a very microeconomic focused trade style, uh, where your kind of, uh, main focus is just exploiting regional supply and demand imbalances, um, and you're trying to drive market efficiency. Um, so it requires, you know, having control over your various shipment lanes, uh, which involves, you know, controlling your own freight. So buying FOB or free on board, uh, which means picked up uh, from your suppliers. So and delivered to your end use customers. And then you can control the entire flow uh, of your transportation in the middle. And that's where physical arbitrage comes in. Uh, there's also a bit of a market maker mentality uh, that you have to have when you're looking at uh, physical arbitrage. Um, because the whole idea of, of this trade style is that you can look at two completely disconnected markets and use freight values to trade one market based off the other market here. So I'm gonna jump into a, an example here. Yeah, I was gonna say, yeah, if you have an example, that'd be great. Cause I, I I'm do. not sure I understand what- uh, It's it's what very high level. Are. Are. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So example here comes from uh, this last crop year here. This is an actual trade uh, that I've done here in the last few months here, um, just closed it out recently, but uh, during the summer and during the spring of 2022, um, kind of our local pricing structure allowed us to buy new crop corn, which is fall of 2022 uh, and spring of 2023 uh, shipment window. Uh, we were able to buy that from our farmers in New York that we work with, um, and we were able to sell that to some Canadian destinations for a margin. Um, so, you know, we have our, our cost of transportation to get from, you know, these New York locations here. Uh, to our various destinations in Canada. We know what those cost. We know that we can sell it for a profit. So we went ahead and locked some of that in. Now, we were dealing with forward contracts at the time. So, you know, we were in spring and summer of 2022. We were contracting for October, November, December of 22 and January through March of 23. As we kind of continued to get further into the summer and into the, the growing season, uh, we saw conditions kind of shape out a little bit differently than we've seen in years past here, where uh, the Canadian growing region um, had a lot of really good moisture, uh, really good conditions, uh, looked like it was going to be a good crop. Pennsylvania, uh, where we also trade, was in a little bit different situation here. Uh, a lot of drought in the north central part of the state and uh, led to some production issues. So as that Canadian crop ended up being much larger than expected, and as the Pennsylvania crop ended up being much smaller than expected, we had some shifts in kind of our local markets here. Um, and so the local prices in Canada were dropping, uh, going all the way through the rest of our growing season, going into harvest. Uh, these numbers were just getting cheaper and cheaper because there was more and more corn around. Uh, you know, if you're looking at a simple supply and demand curve, as you add supply, your equilibrium price needs to drop. On the flip side, looking at Pennsylvania here, we were having the opposite effect here where, you know, we were finding out 65, 70% of a crop is about what to expect. And so again, when you are shifting that supply lower, your equilibrium price is going to naturally 
move higher. So during this process, we kind of established our freight spread or the difference on shipping these New York facilities or New York farmers to Canada versus shipping them to Pennsylvania. And because we know that, you know, what it costs to go to one spot versus what it costs to go to another spot, and we're active in both of these markets, we were able to put together that we could go buy in local Canadian corn at a relative discount to what Pennsylvania was trading for. So this means that instead of shipping my New York corn to Canada, like we originally planned, I went and bought in local Canadian corn and took my New York stuff that I had originally planned to ship north and west, and I took it south. So I was able to buy Canadian crop, sell Pennsylvania crop, and I was able to capture the difference in the middle, which in this trade in particular ended up about taking my, my initial margins and multiplying them by five. Mm -hmm. uh, when I initially traded uh, this corn to Canada, I made about 10 cents a bushel. When I went and did my physical ARB here, I was able to buy back a number that landed in Pennsylvania on a relative number about 50 cents cheaper than what was currently trading. And so, um, again, I was able to trade corn in two different markets and make it make money because of the way that we look at this within our books. So very high level. Uh, feel free to shoot as many questions as you want at me from that, uh, that aspect there. Um, but this is, this is what I spent all day looking at is where can I find areas that, you know, I have an existing book on already where supply and demand imbalances have come in after the fact and I can now exploit that. Yeah, so, uh, I mean, this is a, a, several months, obviously, for the trade. You had that locked in, and then what's the horizon when you decided to, to turn it and, and take it the other direction? Uh, about the time that we were going to ship it. And so, um, you know, by the time that we were getting into October, November here, when we had these contracts that we were supposed to deliver on in Canada, and we had these contracts with farmers that we were supposed to be picking up the corn from their farm, that's when we went and sold the Pennsylvania, bought back in the local Canadian um, and so, yeah, this in particular took several months for it to play out. Um, but we have 300, 400 different farmers that we're buying from at any one different time on my team. We've got probably 30 or 40 uh, different end use customers, uh, add in some other players in the market that are similar to myself that we'll kind of trade for uh, trade with for liquidity purposes. I mean, there's always something to be finding out there. You know, this this one in particular took three, four five months. Um, but every single day when you come in as a physical trader, there's going to be some form of version of this in the market that you can go out and find and exploit. Hmm. Uh, talk about your average day. So, I mean, are you talking to the farmers? You have, you know, hundreds of farmers that you guys are talking to. Is that more um, centralized in terms of the firm that, you know, there's a bunch of people that work with the farmers and then you guys don't, or, or is it each individual trader is working with uh, a set of farmers too? Great question. So um, we, we have a team set up on our uh, in our company. And so different teams uh, are treated as their own profit and loss center. So they're their own individual businesses. Um, and a lot of those are going to be focused more regionally, um, you know, for for the big kind of more liquid products like corn, wheat and soybeans. You know, we're a northeast grains desk. Uh, if you're a little bit uh, of a product that maybe isn't as liquid or at least that we're not in as large of the market share of, um, like feed ingredients, for example, there's a product called wheat mids. Uh, there's a product cotton seed that I mentioned earlier. Those teams trade with a full U.S. focus with one specific commodity that they're focused on. So really, it, it you know, it depends, I would say. Um, but most businesses on the farm side are regionally focused. So, um, you know, there's there's also the train teams, which, again, is going to be more of a U.S. overall focus within the corn markets. But um, it regionally is split out in terms of talking to the actual farm level. So my business is a farm to market business. Uh, and so, you know, our bread and butter is buying from the farmer. Um, you know, the, the propane business that I'm going to here shortly, for example, is hundred percent commercial. Uh, so I won't be talking to, to any farmers. Um, it, you know, it's, it's much different type of customer flow there. Um, some businesses that are, are grain focused are again focused entirely on commercials. So they're dealing with commercial grain elevators who are the ones dealing with the actual farmers. So it very much just depends. We just have a, a kind of open team structure where you do what you can make money on. If that means buying from the farmer, you go make money buying from the farmer. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. And now you're going right to what I was going to ask next in terms of how does that pan out in terms of your day? How much in front of a computer, you know, talking yeah. talk on the phone. So, yeah, just walk us through what that average day looks like. Absolutely. So I'm always behind a desk. Um, I 
travel rarely in my current role. Um, 98% of my time is, is in front of the computer. Um, so, you know, I put out a kind of typical day to day here. So, uh, you know, I'm usually leaving my apartment around seven, seven 30. Um, and because I do trade the East coast, I usually try to get a farmer or two on the phone while I'm driving in, um, put out any fires. Once I get in, uh, when you're shipping physical product places, sometimes you're into, into spec issues. So you got to find a spot for a rejected load. You know, you had a plan to go to one spot, shoot, they're not going to unload you. Now you've got an angry truck driver that you got to deal with finding a place for him to go do his work. Uh, and, and so he'll stop swearing at you on the phone. Um, you know, things like that. Uh, farmers missing payments. Um, you know, these, these are customers of ours. We're providing their, their money that's putting their, you know, food on their table for their family at the end of the day, sending their kids to, uh, you know, to school here. So, um, you know, anything like that, uh, we're just making sure that there's no issues really happening. So what do you uh, so do there? I mean, so like they won't unload you or they won't take the product and you just have to kind of reroute it or find some holding place in interim. I mean, yep. what do you do there? Yep. So, I mean, we have a, you know, like in my market here, we've got a very developed um, just system of different end users. And so, you know, a lot of our end users will trade very tight uh, mycotoxin specs. Uh, so there's certain things that can be produced in the grain growing season uh, that then come out on the end product of the corn. Um, for example, one thing is called vomitoxin. It's a form of mold that grows uh, during the growing season that if it's over a certain parts per million level, um, it will cause animals like pigs, uh, cows, horses, humans uh, to vomit uncontrollably. Um, and so uh, certain certain animals are a little bit more resilient to that. For example, chickens, uh, They'll eat anything. And so, you know, knowing that you're taking, you know, corn uh, to a facility that has a tight vomit toxin spec, let's say 1.3 parts per million. That's what our dog food customers look for on a spec. If you go there and you have over that, you know, part per million requirement, they're not going to dump your load. You got to go figure it out. So, you know, maybe you call up the chicken guy, maybe you call the, the cow guy in the area and you say, hey, you know, we had this load that was going here. It got rejected. What would you buy it for? Um, and so usually that entails a market discount. You got to go figure out somewhere to take it. You got to pay your truck driver to take it to another facility. And so not a good deal. Usually you're losing money in those situations. But does that flow back to the like the farmer or whoever you got it from? Or is that I mean, depends on okay, look, I got this load. It was bad. We were able to load it. But you, you are you able to pass some of that loss off to the initial producer? Yeah just depends on your kind of your situation and, and what's in the contract. You know, if you were clear with the farmer that, Hey, I'm buying this for this specific dog uh, food plant facility, and it needs to be this exact quality. And you're going to, I'm going to write that in the contract. You're going to sign it and send it back to me. Then yeah, I'll discount guys in that situation. If it's, you know, okay, Hey, I know this guy over here is supposed to like the quality of his corn has looked good. I'm going to try to capture the premium in the market by taking this to a facility that's a little bit tighter in order to, you know, try to, try to boost my own books here a little bit. In that case, I, I take the risk. Exactly. Yeah. So it really just depends on, on who's taking that initial risk quality wise. Got it. So after we kind of put out any fires, uh, do a little bit of macro reading. Um, there, there's a lot of, uh, you know, things that go into the, the influences of grain marketing here. Um, you know, this Russia Ukraine war um, has been probably the biggest mover in our markets here the last 12 months. Um, you know, what markets did initially when, when uh, Putin invaded uh, and, and some of the kind of market reactions that have happened since then in terms of, you know, uh, him allowing wheat to be shipped out of the Black Sea, then not allowing it to be shipped out of the Black Sea, then changing his mind again. Um, you know, large, large macro type happenings here that are having a major effect on our markets. Now, you can break down into other areas that are going to have an effect here too, kind of from the macro perspective. You know, what is weather in Brazil doing, you know, how is the South American crop looking and how is that going to affect our world corn market here? Um, because everything trades, you know, kind of world priced here. Um, so there's a lot of just different factors that we like to do some reading on, get a feel for what's going around uh, just in the world that day. That way we can inform our farmers what we're seeing. Uh, we can develop a little bit of a flat price bias or futures price bias uh, in order to help our farmers, you know, figure out when they want to be pricing stuff as well. Um, kind of hitting on that briefly, um, we are hedgers. And so when we're buying physical corn, I'm going to be selling futures. When I'm selling physical corn, I'm going to be buying futures. And so I'm inherently hedged in terms of up and down price risk, but my farmers are not, my end users are not. These guys have stake 
in the game in terms of getting the best prices or the cheapest prices, depending on which side of the market they're on. Um, and so while I'm you know, not exposed to flat price myself, I do a lot of flat price research. I do a little bit of charting and technical analysis uh, in order to help my guys make the right decisions at the right time. Um, so just wanted to throw that in there real quick. Do you guys ever, I mean, do you ever take a, a, a more of a stake and not hedge or do you, is that just kind of company policy that you hedge, hedge um, on your trades? I'm going to go back to my favorite answer here for our company, which is that it depends. Um, you know, there's there's some teams like we do actually have some prop teams that will actually take, you know, actual prop positions in the marketplace. Um, you know, whether that is just on, mar you know, options market making, trying to capture some some theta, um, some um, volatility, um, you know, whatever the trade that they're looking at is. I mean, there we have a prop desk that will you know, trade derivatives any which way they want to. Um, they'll go long, they'll go short. Uh, but in general, most of our businesses are 100% hedged here. Um, where we do spec a little bit in my book is uh, on the future spread side. Um, and so one thing I was mentioning earlier is how, you know, sometimes the market will, you know, incentivize you to store stuff uh, where it's a higher price down the road. Those spreads in between your different months of which your futures are trading are always going to be changing as well. And so uh, maybe there's, uh, you know, a fun phenomenon out in the market that where you're seeing a lot of uh, grain be shipped to um, a delivery location for the actual futures contract. That's going to have a spreads implication. You can try to position yourself around it. So, you know, maybe your overall flat price hedged on corn, but your long March futures and your short May futures or your, you know, long July futures and short December futures. Um, so again, overall hedged, but you do have some spread risk out there. And hey, when you're doing your macro reading, are you looking at just kind of online industry reports, uh, newspaper? I mean, what, what, yep. what's your kind of source of information for some of this stuff? Yeah. So there's some private market wires that we subscribe to, um, that are, you know, guys that are either, you know, within the brokerage house that we actually use for our futures accounts. Uh, that are trading themselves and, um, you know, are, are taking on a little bit of that, you know, flat price risk themselves and, and have a little bit more skin in the game. Um, there's a newsletter uh, that I read every day. It's called the Van Trump Report. It's just a, a guy who uh, is a farmer himself who's been trading futures for 40, 50 years at this point um, and uh, is just very well respected and well known in the grain industry um, in terms of having a good pulse on the both macro and micro markets that influence him. Um, so, you know, anywhere that we can get, um, you know, a lot of it just tends to be more private wires because it is fairly, uh, a fairly closed door industry. Um, but there's also stuff that we'll look at in general, you know, I'll, like I'll look at what, you know, what's Dow Jones doing? What's S and P doing? Is that going to have, you know, uh, a weight in terms of risk classes here today? You know, is, is the idea here that everyone's going risk off? So we should expect futures to be down because there'll be funds flowing out of futures. Um, you know, it's anything and everything, uh, that you can kind of look at is what we'll, what we'll take an eye on. Thanks. Yep. So once we're feeling a little bit good about, you know, what's going on, um, market opens up, um, our market markets open from nine 30 to one 30, uh, Chicago time, uh, is kind of our standard. Um, there's also overnight hours as well, but, uh, these are our main trade hours here. So, um, during this time, I'm trying to be on the phone with as many farmers and end users in our market as possible. Uh, and just, just paint a picture of what's going on out there. Um, most of the information that we trade off of is given to us at a at a personal level. You know, we're talking to farmers here and, hey, this guy, he's having yield issues because, you know, his growing area was really dry. And so now that we're in harvest, we're seeing that his yield is 25 percent shy of normal. Or, you know, we're hearing that this guy over here who normally plants 500 acres of corn is only going to plant 300 acres of corn this year. What are the other 200 acres going to? Um, and, you know, the more and more people that you talk to that you're going to get these little bits and pieces of information from, uh, A, you're doing business with them. Uh, you need them out there in terms of, you know, capturing your product and maintaining a margin structure. But B, you piece together these little conversations and make an overall market bias that then allows you to, to trade the region. So, um, you know, I, I do a lot of research on my own um, in terms of our positioning. You know, I'm looking at, um, you know, state by state yield numbers, state by state acreage numbers to figure out, okay, what's, you know, what does 2023 supply look like compared to 2022? Okay, we're down 15% on supply. We want to be long this whole year. 
uh, we're up 30% in production. All right, maybe we should look at trading this year from a short bias this year, um, you know, things like that. But at the end of the day, especially with the physical arbitrage, where it comes down to actually knowing where your supply excess is and your supply uh, shortage is, and being able to put those pieces together, it all just comes from phone conversations with your boots on the ground. So it's a very relationship heavy business. Um, obviously, you've got to be able to be analytical, but if you can't extract info from a conversation with a person, um, physical trading is going to be very difficult. So that's kind of the focus uh, while the market's open. Uh, market closes, uh, 1.30, we shift to a little bit more paperwork, uh, setting up logistics. Um, you know, my business is primarily truck based. Um, so we use uh, semi trucks to move 95% of the product that we trade. Um, you know, some teams will be 100% rail focused. Some teams will be 100% barge focused. Um, I've also traded a couple ocean vessels in uh, my days. So, uh, you know, maybe you're trading, trading ocean vessels, but overall uh, you get to be in a little bit more focused on the logistical side of the business, making sure that your paperwork's flowing through right. Um, that there's not any accounting errors uh, from your you know, prior day trades or your current day trades. Um, we'll have a lot of market discussion meetings across the company within our teams, um, just kind of focuses a little bit more on strategizing and your operations of your business. So that's really the, what the day-to-day -day looks like. Um, you know, the one thing that I always throw out there is no two days ever look the same, whether that's, you know, a different kind of market structure that you're seeing for the day, um, different issues that you're dealing with, different farmers you're talking to, um, never is it the same day. Um, and that's probably the thing that I like the most about this role is that, you know, there's always something new, there's always something different. And, you know, by being the first one to look at something, you can usually find an edge. Using proprietary software, I mean, what kind of stuff are you using on the computer most of the time? Are you... Uh, um... Yeah, so um, here, let me, uh, let me pop out of this here. Um, so, you know, in terms of some of our softwares here, um, you know, we use a, a program called Market View uh, to look at our, our futures pricing here. So um, it's a little bit messy because I'm viewing it on the small screen rather than the big screen here today. But, um, you know, I'll have my prices for corn, prices for wheat, prices for soybeans. Uh, those are my, or excuse me, corn, soybeans, wheat. Those are my three main that I trade right now. I'll kind you of have uh, I, I can't see that you got to I think you got to share your screen different oh is it oh shoot yeah yeah so I just shared that tab or that one so just go to your screen share and maybe swap it there you go there we go all right yeah so corn soybeans wheat here um and so you know kind of like I was mentioning here um you won't be able to see very many prices here because the market's closed today uh being president's day but um you know, you'll see March, May, July, September, December. These are our corn futures months that we trade. Um, our last price is here, 677 and three quarters, 677 and a half, 666, 610. You can see that, you know, these different time frames trade on different values here. Um, and so, you know, when I'm quoting a farmer for, you know, nearby corn, I'm probably going to go off of the March or the May. Um, if a farmer is looking for a price off of the December, I'm going to quote him a, a price with a basis off of his December. So I, I kind of skipped over the idea of basis, uh, but when we're you know setting prices or looking at an area, we trade a spread off of the Chicago futures board. So uh, corn right now in Pennsylvania, for example, is trading 125 over the March board for current shipment. So you add 125 cents to 677, you get 802 is what corn is worth in Pennsylvania. So. Again, you know, if I were to go quote a guy off of harvest time shipment, I'm not going to be quoting him 802. I'm going to be quoting him a basis off of 595 rather than 677 pricing here. And that's just as the market prices in a larger supply coming into harvest, um, you, you naturally get a price drop out there. But we'll use this software just for looking at prices. Um, in terms of trading, I have another software. Um, I don't have it open here today because the market's closed. Uh, but we use a, a software called T4, um, which just allows me to go in instead of actually, you know, calling up my futures broker in Chicago and saying, hey, I need you to sell me some corn. I'll just go in and I'll actually trade it on my screen whenever I'm buying from a farmer. Um, so, so we've got so a lot of proprietary you, you mentioned, software as well. Yeah, you mentioned the um, kind of importance of those relationships mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, kind of how that's such such a big part of what you're doing. Yep. Uh, you think about the 
you know, trading has gone more electronic, right? Like you just said, you don't have to call up your broker anymore. You can just do this, some of that electronic. You see some of the big exchanges that have gone primarily electronic. Yep. I mean, how do you think about kind of your job and this transition to, um, you know, AI, automation, uh, other factors? Like, uh, you know, when, when you, just a story of, hey, you've got a truck somewhere and they won't take it. And you got, I mean, that the computer can't figure that out, right? I mean, there's exactly you, you a whole bunch of that. But, but what else would you say in terms of that piece of the puzzle uh, with your day to day job um, and kind of automation in mind? Yeah. So, I mean, we're, we're always, I'd say wary of automation. Um, but at the end of the day, you know, what you just described there is, is exactly the point here. You can't have a computer figure out, okay, this corn came from this particular farm, which, you know, came with a speck of this. So we need to ship this here and I got to pay the truck driver this much money. So that he isn't mad at me and comes back and works for me again. You know, that no computer is going to be able to solve that problem for you. Um, at the same time, there's always ways uh, that technology can be driving efficiency. Um, you know, whether that's looking at, you know, some of those arbitrages, like I mentioned, in terms of efficient freight routes, people are trying to develop that. Um, so far, it hasn't been able to be done because, again, at the end of the day, a lot of this comes down to the personal relationship, you know, going to truck transportation specifically, um, you know, maybe your rates that you have as you're looking at freight spreads Maybe you have a good relationship with one truck driver. And so he gives you a discounted rate relative to anyone else in the market. Computer's not going to be able to know that. Um, and so where, where our business in the supply chain and being an actual provider of a product here, whether that's, you know, the marketing service of, you know, being able to, to hedge your prices as a grower, whether that's, you know, the actual transportation um, of the product. Um, but because there's an actual person that you're dealing with on every transaction here, I believe physical trading, at least the way that we look at it, is going to be around and not really able to be automated out. Um, just it comes down to customer customer relationships here and being able to manage a trade book with the aspect of taking care of your customer. Um, I mean, maybe maybe I'll shoot myself and be wrong here. I mean, shoot myself in the foot here, be wrong 20, 30 years from now. But I just I, I just don't see a, a way that a computer can really disrupt our market. Um, I think it could be a value add, you know, if I could have a program telling me, Hey, you input all your freight values into me. And I can tell you that there's a million dollars worth of arbitrage out on the table. If you do it, this, this, and this way, you know, that would have value. Um, but they're not going to be, you know, computer isn't going to be able to pick up the phone, talk to a truck driver, call a farmer, ask them what's going on at their, you know, farm level. Um, it, there, there's just too much of a relationship aspect to this side of trading. Yeah, I think that, I mean, when I think about trading, I always just think of that information asymmetry, right? You're gathering information, using that information to make decisions, uh, you know, better or worse than the next person and, and, and transacting. And you think about all that different information. Look, if you could quantify all that and put it into a system and, you know, digitize it, sure, right? You could have some algorithm that could spit things out for you in, in terms Absolutely. of solutions and whatnot. But as soon as you say, well, yeah, you got to talk to the chart driver. You got to talk to the farmer. As soon as you have a human involved in any of those steps, well, then that's going to blow up. And so you just can't, it just doesn't work. And, and then now you've got it in multiple steps, right? You've got it on the front end, the back end, and in between, you've got a human involvement. And so, uh, you know, for the foreseeable future, you know, that, that's not going to change. You could think about automated truck drivers, right? Where they have these trucks, you know, do whatever else, but, but still in the end, you know, if they're going different directions each day and doing other things, you've got to have somebody there coordinating it and, uh, and there's going to be human involvement. Exactly. And, you know, I, I know I keep hitting on farmers, you know, end users, you know, those are the buzzwords I keep hitting here because, you know, that's the market I've been in five years here as a farmer based market. But, you know, uh, other other examples are, are the same, you know, whether you're on the oil and gas side, you know, you've got an actual buyer. Um, for, you know, these various companies that are, you know, actually sourcing um, their oil and gas that they're going to blend together and go put at their gas station. You know, you're not dealing with a spreadsheet here that says, hey, we need X amount of barrels here. Uh, you're dealing with an actual person on the phone that says, hey, I need this. Can you get it to me? Uh, and so as long as that is, you know, still the way that that these, you know, large commodity deals are done, um, it will be that way forever. Yeah, sounds good. Thanks. 
so kind of building off what you were, were just asking about there, you know, regarding, you know, the, more of the technological side here, um, you know, these are some keys to physical trading success that I think, you know, if someone's interested in the industry, if they can come in with these in mind, uh, I, I think that they can have a long-term career. Um, and, you know, this is the way that I look at it for myself, but obviously the relationship building there, kind of like I said, being able to, you know, have conversations with other players in the marketplace uh, and be able to, you know, piece together information, that's your single most valuable uh, skill that you could have as a physical trader. Uh, attention to detail, very close second. Um, you know, I mentioned earlier that we're dealing with, you know, single digit profit margins here. Uh, you mess up one little thing and that margin can turn negative in a moment. Um, I've certainly had, you know, trades I've missed details on. Um, for one of them, it was, you know, this is probably my, my first most painful trade that I messed up. Uh, was I was supposed to price out some bushels for a farmer uh, that was on our book. Um, it was, you know, a market price at the time. I thought I put the trade order in. Uh, I didn't. Three or four days later, I came in, realized that I never actually got that hedge done. Market prices had changed. It cost us about $10,000 uh, in terms of me having to go back, give that farmer their original price that I told them they were going to get and the actual hedge that I was able to do. And so it was as simple as me just forgetting to hit a button that cost us $10,000, turn that from, you know, a positive trade to a negative trade just instantly. So um, if you're not detail oriented, it is a tough industry. Curiosity. Um, some of what I keep mentioning here about, you know, finding that next piece of information just involves asking questions to these, you know, these customers that you're dealing with, you know, all right, what's your pain point? You know, uh, you can buy it at this price, but, you know, how much can you buy at that price? Is there, is there an end to, you know, what you can get done there? Um, just always asking that next question in order to try to, you know, paint a slightly better picture than the next guy that's in the market. Uh, Got to be competitive. Uh, kind of continuing on that last one. There's someone else always in the market looking for the same type of opportunity. Um, you know, my market probably has seven or eight different uh, trade groups doing, you know, exactly what we do here. Um, and so, you know, if I'm not willing to be the first one to try to think of something a certain way, if I'm not the first one asking a question, someone else is going to beat me to the punch here. And, you know, part of, part of our ability to be profitable is being quicker, uh, than other folks in the market here. And just analytical, um, numbers don't lie. I usually come back to that at the end of the day. If, if you can, if you can explain something to me one way or another in numbers on why we should or shouldn't trade something, um, yeah, numbers don't lie. Hey, talk a little bit about the risk side of it. <clears throat> so I, I know we've had some students that have gone and they've done fantastically, right? Like you in terms of trading and others that have, have maybe struggled because of, I mean, at some point you're trading and it's real numbers and it's real dollars and you're going to make mistakes and you're going to lose money. And, you know, that, that can, uh, just personality wise, I think some personalities deal with that type of risk better than others. Uh, how has that been on for you in terms of, you know, dealing with that? Yeah, no, good question. Um, you know, part of when we're actually interviewing people, you know, we're a very qualitative based, uh, you know, interview process to come to work for the Andersons. It's very personality based. But one of the things that we look for is risk tolerance, um, just because, you know, in order to a move across the country, you know, if we're talking about, you know, Anderson's recruiting someone from Utah State, uh, you know, we don't have any offices out there. We've got Kansas City, we've got Toledo, you know, stuff like that. So obviously there's a risk alone in just being able to take that jump and, and you know, put put faith into something like a company like ours. Uh, but specifically, you know, transactionally, the idea of, you know, getting into something that you've never done, you know, how do you come out knowing that you're going to do well? Um, really, it just comes down to, you know, does someone believe that they have the skills that can put them at an edge in this? So, you know, when I hit on these relationship building, attention to detail, curious, you know, if someone feels that those are strong attributes of theirs and they're willing to try something new, that's typically where we find the most successful uh, young traders. Um, and so it's, it's very much, you know, about being yourself. If you aren't competitive, if you aren't analytical, if you aren't curious, it's probably not for you. You know, it's, it's, it's very uh, cut and dry in that sense, but, um, most people, though, that have come in and done well in this industry are just personable, but hungry. Um, and so if you can if you can manage to be personable and hungry and analytical all at the same time, hmm. most of the time the risk pays off. Interesting. And resiliency, I'd say, too, because 
I don't know. To go specifically, I add a little bit of background in this. Door-to-door -door traders I've, or door-to-door -door salesmen, I feel like, become the best traders. So, you know, if someone has experience in pest control or solar and they want to get into the world of, of trading and physical trading, I'd probably hire them. Hmm, interesting. So I guess I'll kind of wrap things up then with just a little bit of advice for anyone that would be, you know, interested in trading. Um, and, and this goes a little bit more uh, general than just physical trading or commodity trading here, um, but maintain a long-term picture. Um, this is something that I struggled with earlier on in my career. Um, you know, opportunities sometimes involve locations that you may not want to be to uh, or be living in. Uh, it may be temporary. Um, and, you know, putting in that temporary pain period may have a, a, a trade-off in the end. Um, you may be putting markets that don't necessarily excite you. Um, you know, I didn't come from a farm background. I didn't want to spend my whole career being, you know, a farm to market guy. Um, for me, that meant five years of being that guy and I got an opportunity to not now. Um, so, you know, just maintaining that long-term goal of, hey, I'm doing something that's moving towards my long-term goal here. Um, you know, even if that's taking a, a trader job and something that isn't exactly what you want to do, but you know, it will get you closer. Um, just maintaining that focus. Um, curiosity, um, you know, whether you're looking at, at stocks, whether you're looking at commodities, just always asking the question, why? Um, if you're not going to ask why and drill into something, um, you're probably not going to be able to find an edge in the market. Um, be willing to do the dirty work of those around you. Uh, you know, if you're a junior trader or, or you know, trainee, um, find the pain points of whatever team you're on uh, and be able to, you know, take a little bit of work off of those senior guys, senior gals that you may be working with uh, in terms of, you know, if you can provide value to, to a team that you get on in any way, shape or form from day one, even if it's just as simple as taking care of the pain points, you will learn, you'll develop, Traders will will take an interest in you because you're making their life easy. Um, you, you just have overall much more opportunities to develop if you're willing to do the work that no one else wants to. And then just read or listen to other traders, um, even in other areas. Uh, you know, I, I listen to a lot of macro hedge fund guys just to get a picture of what's going on in the world. Um, you know, I'm not really trading anything macro based other than, you know, corn up, corn down. Um, but you know, just being able to hear perspectives and, and, and grasp a, a type of thinking uh, that other folks out in the market may be using, um, I've found to be very valuable. <clears throat> yeah, great, great advice. As you were even saying that, I was thinking of, I mean, look, you're trading your time and your effort for future benefits to some extent, right? I mean, you're, you're still trading. It's still kind of a trade and understanding the scope of that. Okay, look, it's going to take some pain up front. It's going to take maybe some steps along the way to get me some of that experience. But here's where I'm going. Here's the goal. And uh, and I, you can kind of see it progressing in that area. So I, I almost That's a great way to look that, at it. That, that is a Yeah, you're, you're trading, you're trading some of your time and effort uh, for some of that experience. And, and it's not always going to be an, an immediate payoff. But but uh, if you can have that longer term picture, you can see that down the road. So that's, that's great advice. Absolutely. Well, before we dive into questions, I know that at least when I was in, in this boat here, my biggest question was always, okay, yeah, but what can you make uh, in the industry? Um, and so, you know, I, I just wanted to hit on that um, fairly early on. In terms of, of time invested to reward, I think that trading is, is probably the best option out there. Um, you know, I, this company that I've worked for since day one, I don't think I've ever put more than 45 or 50 hours in a week. Uh, even as a, you know, fresh trainee. Um, and I've seen seen double digit percentage uh, salary bumps every year, um, usually by like your three or four year mark. Um, you are, you know, bonusing out pretty well. Uh, you get paid bonuses based on how well your team does. 15% uh, of your team's profit and loss at the end of the year goes into a bonus pool. Um, and you get paid out based on basically percentages of business uh, from there. So it is a little bit discretionary in terms of the managers choose that. But um, just to just to paint the picture here, my, my third year out of college, I hit six figures and I've been in six figures total comp ever since then working 45, 50 hours a week. So again, just wanted to throw that out there um, that it is a, a very work-life balance, high comp industry. How, uh, what's, what's the mix there in terms of bonus versus salary? 
Um, your first five, 10 years, it's going to be uh, salaries a little bit heavier weighted um, just in terms of actual dollar amounts. Um, I would say your bonus tends to grow each year as you build a bigger and bigger book. Um, so, I mean, there's guys, you know, I'm trying to think of the best way to describe this. The salaries here are all livable. Yeah. There are some guys that are pulling in bonuses 10 X their salary. So um, I wouldn't say that's, that's the most common. I would say, yeah, but it's doable. Like that, that can happen for a 10 year guy, two to three X your base salary is a standard bonus. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, I knew it was highly bonus based, but and it, the assumption would be that it progresses through time, right. As you get yes. uh, more experience and, and can take on more of that risk a little bit, but yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. That's that, that's good to put some actual numbers to it in terms of thinking. Yeah. It. No, definitely. So, I mean, I started, you know, 2018, 58, five base, I think it was, um, rolling into this next year, I'll be, I'll be mid nineties. So, um, you know, base has been very aggressive each year. Um, and, and then bonus, um, again, it just depends on your team, but, um, I was close to my salary this last year. Yeah. Do you switching from ag grains to propane? Is it, is it going to be a different structure there? You, do you have to start over to some extent? How's that, how's that switch look? So it's a, I don't want to call it a lateral move. I don't want to call it an upward move. It's a diagonal move. I would call it in terms of, you know, what I'm doing here. Um, and so, um, you know, our propane team is, is uh, they don't take new traders on. Um, and so it's, it's definitely, you know, step up in terms of a kind of my progression. Um, it's a new market though. Um, totally new product class. Um, it's traded under a different breakup. You know, I'm used to trading bushels, 56 pounds, in a bushel, um, you know, I'm going to be trading gallons now. Um, so there's going to be a lot of just kind of different, um, different nuances to learn. Um, but part of our training in, you know, the way that we do things here at Anderson's is that you learn that you're, you're trading a widget at the end of the day. So you learn the ins and outs of your widget. Corn is corn. Soybeans are soybeans. Wheat is wheat. Propane is propane. At the end of the day, it's all just a number. Um, and so there'll be a lot of new things for me, but at the end of the day, the style, um, you know, that physical arbitrage that I was mentioning, um, it's there. Yeah. Yeah. Fantastic. Hey, uh, I've actually had them, they were emailed me questions before and I've kind of fit those in throughout the conversation. So I'm not sure we're going to have any here, uh, but if they want to reach out to you, I assume you've got your email in, uh, contact info that they can reach out to you and have questions and, uh, and, uh, and touch base. Yep. Yep. Email should be right there. Is it yep. everyone still see that? Yep. Yep. We see that. Perfect. Perfect. Yep. So, uh, oh shoot. Yeah. So if anyone's got, you know, questions, feel free to, to shoot. Um, you know, if anyone's interested in, you know, learning more about kind of our actual career, uh, opportunities here, uh, you know, we do a, uh, an internship, uh, on a trade desk here. Um, it's typically focused on juniors, but we have had, uh, some very successful sophomores here the last couple of years. Um, and so, you know, we're not just open or just looking at upperclassmen there, but, um, yeah, if anyone's interested in, you know, actually getting out to Kansas city for a summer and, you know, learning some, uh, some commodity trading, um, definitely shoot me a note. Yeah, that, that'd be fantastic. You by chance coming back out to recruit next year at the career fair or what, uh, is that going to be an annual thing we can see you or, or planning on it, planning on it for now, at least. So, okay. uh, they haven't kicked me out of it yet, but, uh, yeah, <laughs> I should be there on campus in, uh, I believe it's usually September whenever they do the big, uh, Huntsman school yeah. career fair. So yeah, early fallish, yeah. Early October, late September, somewhere in there. So yeah. Perfect. Perfect. Hey, well, we really appreciate your time. Thanks so much, especially on a holiday when I mess things up and, uh, and schedule you on president's day. Uh, hey. your willingness to help out is, is fantastic. I really do appreciate it. I was, I was going to be here working anyway. So, uh, you know, <laughs> if anything, thank you to, to you and, and to all the students here for being willing to hop on on a day where you guys weren't doing your normal thing here. So perfect. Perfect. Hey, thanks Dylan. Uh, yep. listen, anything I can do to help out on my end ever, whatever, like students connect you with internships, whatever else, don't hesitate, but, uh, I really do appreciate this. And, uh, I look forward to seeing you again in the fall and uh, talk to you.